Hey, everybody. Michael Gridley here, uh, back for another week of Acquisitions Anonymous. Uh, today is a special episode because we have a searcher who actually works for me named Jake Greer. Say hi, Jake. Hello, everybody. Uh, Jake is actually looking at a couple deals for for buying, and he and I work together uh, inside of my family office, so uh, excited to have him here today. And today is an episode all about us looking at a couple pool construction companies for sale. So uh, here, post-COVID, like a ton of pool construction companies have come on the market. Uh, it is a very interesting time for pool construction, and uh, we are digging in and kind of figuring out what this market looks like. So today we have two deals uh, that we're going to go through. Um, Jake's been looking at these. And then I'm here with my co-host, Bill and Mills, and we're going to dig into these and either hate them or most likely hate them because that's what we do every week. So uh, with no further ado, uh, Bill has our first deal, uh, which is a pool construction company located here in my neck of the woods, Texas. So over to you, Bill. All right. So this is sexy because not only is it pool construction, it's Austin, Texas. Uh, which everyone knows is sexy these days. So this is this business for sale for eight point four million dollars. Um, it is a custom pool builder uh, in Austin, Texas. They do about two point one million dollars of cash flow, so they're asking exactly four times cash flow on about twenty four million dollars of revenue. So eight percent EBITDA, eight percent EBITDA margins, roughly. Uh, they say they've got one hundred twenty five thousand dollars of inventory and three hundred thirty thousand dollars of equipment. Um, they also say that this 8.4 million is for 80% ownership of the business. So the seller wants to roll 20%, which is encouraging, but that actually tells you the valuation is in fact five times. Um, so a little over 10 million rather than four times uh, at 8 million. Um, so it says since 2010, business has been around a while, uh, and the name here is in the teaser, so I'm not giving away anything confidential. Since 2010, Denali Pools has grown into one of the top two pool builders in the hottest real estate market in the United States, Austin, Texas. The company is a classic private equity platform acquisition to then expand with acquisitions of other pool builders in adjacent markets and pool maintenance companies. With around 300 pools built in 2021 and an estimated Austin market demand for 100,000 pools, there is massive opportunity for growth and taking market share. Denali is seeking a growth partner to acquire 80% of the company, keep the team in place, provide the capital and vision for high growth. Um, as I mentioned, they have $23.8 million in sales and $2.1 million of adjusted EBITDA, so we would have to dig into that. They have a 56% four-year compounded annual growth rate. Uh, on revenue, which is pretty good. Um, and it says for 2022, it's only January when they listed this, they already have $11 million in sales booked uh, for the year. So they're already in January, almost halfway uh, to their 2020, their prior year revenue. Um, it says they've got a debt-free balance sheet and a million dollars in cash. Uh, they got a 4.9 out of five Google rating. Um, customers love them. They say they've got management and crews already in place and ready to scale. The team was recruited from outside the pool industry. They make this sound good, but I don't know if that's good to bring best in class construction ideas to the company. <laughs> There's a construction manager in place who's not an owner and the co-owner Mitch uh, Huntsman manages sales. Remember, Mitch wants to roll his 20% and stick around. Um, they say they got a great culture. They focus on fun. Um, Denali loves training. They train all their people. Um, so this is in place for high scalability. They go on to talk about how awesome the Austin market is um, and that subcontractors view Denali as the best pool general contractor in the market. Um, and they can start as fast as permitted, which is about one to two months. Competitors are backed up about a year. Uh, I have questions about how they do that. Uh, it says, this is probably important. It says Denali Pools works with Glazier Homes, an exclusive custom home builder to refer their clients to Denali Pools. Glazier is a huge home construction company. Um, and marketing, they would do almost zero marketing spend. And they just bought nine pickup trucks in 2020 uh, with high-end decals as moving billboards. And they say they're poised for growth. Um, whoever wrote this teaser knows exactly what people are looking for. Let me tell you that. <laughs> uh, so what do you guys think? There's some interesting oh, stuff here. He, he uh, This guy who started it, his last name is Glazier. It's a little bit further down. So, you know, their biggest refer is Glazier Homes. And then this guy who started is Jared Glazier. Um, so that's pretty interesting. 
And then he brought in his friend. So it's like, oh, your number one retail source like happens to be owned by a guy with the same last name as you, like in terms of referrals. That's something just to be be notable. There's so, the rub. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jake, Jake, you're about to say something. Well, there, it just seems like there's a lot of really interesting nuggets in there. I mean, first, they said they're all about fun. I'm all about fun. I like to party. That's why <laughs> it drew my attention. But, I mean, we're also talking about Austin, Texas, which is hotter than a $2 pistol. Everybody's moving there. It, 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 it has a lot of tailwinds going for it. Um, you know, we're t- we are talking five times. That seems a little bit rich. Uh, and I wonder... I wonder what sort of dynamics would be involved with leaving 20% ownership with the current team. I also, who knows, maybe, maybe this is the best way to go about it. Let's say, let's, let's start at the back end. Let's do a, a postmortem. Let's say you bought this. Now, now we're two, three years down the road and it has failed spectacularly. <laughs> How has that happened? Cause I, you know, my background is in trading I'm, I'm now, that's my whole career. And now I'm on this entrepreneur kick and my strategy is called, I have no idea what I'm doing. And so far I've executed perfectly. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think as Michael said, if this were to fail, I think he, he would say the relationship with Glacier Homes unraveled and they lost a whole bunch of referrals and probably face and reputation in the market and, hmm. uh, and all yeah. that stuff. Uh, or, you know, a nuclear missile hit Austin, Texas, or something like that, right? Where your where your market just rolled over. Um, There's no mention case. of customer concentration, so that that makes you kind of wonder, right? On a listing like this, like they've they've teed it up, they've served it up on a silver platter, you know, private equity ready, which probably means it's not. Uh, it just in 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 my experience, but no mention of customer concentration, and that was a good catch, Michael, in the last name. It it probably was a member of the family who's like, Hey, we spend a bunch of money on pools. Uh, why don't, why don't we just, you know, capture this line item and, and start to extract value for ourselves. That That's a major, major risk in my mind because you go, okay, what does the family know that I don't know about, you know, what, what's around the bin, so to speak. Yeah. Although I do think it's encouraging that they want to roll, right. That, you know, I mean, it, it's, when have we seen people that want to roll? Right? Yeah. Ever. The only the only issue I have is like what they're saying is, hey, we want somebody to come on as a growth partner and help fund growth. From what I can tell from this this sim, the business is not capital intensive. They have nine pickup trucks. So that means they're not building their own pools. They don't have excavators. They don't have backhoes. They're subbing all that work out. This business doesn't they don't they don't spend any money on customer acquisition costs. They've already already told you that. So what what is the money going to go to? Because the business theoretically should generate cash. They have cash on their balance sheet and no debt. To me, it like there's just something there that doesn't totally pass a sniff test about. Yeah, twenty percent is is it's a roll, right? It's 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 rolling equity, which helps, and that's a good signal. I don't know that it's enough to really keep them that engaged. If they own a you know hundred and fifty million dollar home building business, it may just be kind of a little bit of a, a dis- I don't know. I, I don't, I, I doesn't totally add up to me. Yeah. So that's, that's a question. Like, why are they selling? Like, this just seems like an ATM machine and these folks don't seem like they're getting old. Right. Like, which is your typical kind of reason to, to sell the business. Um, so and they I don't guess, want to leave, right. They're not trying to get out. They're going yeah. to keep working there. Yeah. So there's the I other, think, the other yeah, thing yeah, that, stands out to me is that, you know, basically if you do the math, 300 pulls a year, that's, that's decent. That's a decent size. Um, obviously they're, you know, comparing themselves to other folks in the Austin market and they're number two, but that's like $80,000 per pool. That's not, that's not your average price point for track home related pool construction. I mean, you know, if you're selling a, a five or $600,000 house, um, you know, it might be a $40,000 pool. And those are discretionary items that the home builder says, hey, do you want a pool? We have a part. But most of the time, those folks aren't putting in $80,000 pools. $80,000 pools are in nicer neighborhoods after the fact. It, it's not usually in conjunction with a track home sale. So you get the you get the idea. These are more custom pools. Is it... Um... Is it common for pool construction businesses to sub out or do they generally have their own equipment, excavators, and do it all themselves? 
Yes. Both. <laughs> I mean, right. It, it depends. It depends on the business, right? I mean, and, and there are really, really great businesses that do it both ways. It just is what type of business do you want to be in, Jake? Do you want to be running construction crews? Do you want backhoes? Do you want, you know, excavators and heavy equipment? That's a very difficult job because you're talking about, you know, a really nice house. If somebody can afford an $80,000 pool, they, they have a nice house. So you're putting all that equipment in their backyard, you're digging a hole, you're putting rebar in it. And then they say, I think they do some, you know, shotcrete and gunite. And um, in Texas, that, that's, that's the type of pool you really want to target because it's a higher price point than vinyl or fiberglass. Um, but, right, th- so it's hard, it's hard if you self-perform the installation. It's also really hard to manage subs because somebody else still has to put a backhoe in, in a person's backyard and dig a hole. And there's a whole bunch of, you know, headaches that come along with that. Um, uh, but, but there are people who make it work both ways. If you don't self-perform, then fundamentally you're a sales and project management organization. That's your business. It's, yeah. It sounds like management. there's risk on, there's risk on both sides, whether you do it yourself sub out. And also it, they mentioned, uh, the backlog of their competitors. If their competitors are subbing out, maybe they're kind of bidding for the same job, cuts into their margins, their lead times expand as well. I would say they're bragging that their lead time is one to two months when everybody else's is a year. I take that as a really big issue, not not something that you should hmm. pat yourself on the back about. That means that either, right, you you haven't been charging enough up until this point, um, you know, or or maybe you're charging too much. I don't, there's, some, there's something in the supply and demand realm that makes me think, okay, it's good for those other folks. Right now is historically the longest backlog time for swimming pool builders because last summer and the summer before you couldn't go to public pools. And so part of the issue in the industry right now is that a lot of that demand that was probably two to three years out, people thinking about getting pools has all been pulled into the present. So you had systemically higher pool construction revenue and request in 2020 and 2021 but it wasn't because all of a sudden there's more pool candidates it's just that the people who are going to buy them over the next several years are doing it sooner so there's some latency there that you may you should expect right some demand to fall off going forward because you've captured it sooner yeah and i i actually when i was digging into this i thought that was a little bit of a flag because you're you're kind of pulling demand forward you already have a high multiple Maybe, maybe Michael said, why are they selling? Which is every broker's uh, chance to deflect and never answer. But uh, it, it may be the case that they are selling because the numbers look great, the timing's right, and it's essentially 5X. If they can get some sucker to grab it, bingo. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, I mean, I would say it's yeah. always the most important question. Right. Why, why are you selling? Why, why am I on the other side of this trade? You know, it, why am I a decent recipient? Um, so I, mm-hmm. I would say no matter what, it's important. But yes, if they're if it appears that they're top ticking and trying to kind of, you know, score while everything's up and to the right, then it's it's much more important. Sorry, Bill, go ahead. Mills, you're speaking my language, man. That's some trading terminology right there. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to check your resume. <laughs> well, I think that you, you, we've had a few... We've had a few folks on the podcast that have bought these type of businesses before. And somehow in my mind, it had that they were trading somewhere in the three-ish to three and a half times EBITDA stuff. And that, so that's consistent with your idea, Mills, that maybe these are all coming on the market at once now because people are like, oh, this is a great time to sell, uh, especially if I think I can get five times, five times EBITDA. And by the way, this is five times adjusted EBITDA. So we have to see what the real one real one is in terms of of the the multiple here for this business at the listing price. So let me let me be the uh the whatever the opposite of devil's advocate is. If you don't like this one, you know, like are you ever going to like a bull construction company? <laughs> like we when we've had past guests on, you know, we had Brent and uh Xavier on before, right? Both pool guys and what they yeah. say, the market matters a ton. Yeah. Right? So you've got a great market, right? It's Austin, Texas. It's hot as shit. You know, it's growing. Like everybody's going to want a pool, right? It's a great market. You've got, it's got decent scale. It's 2 million in EBITDA. You've got a management team that wants to stick around, right? Which is not nothing. Um, and they've got 
at least some backlog. I mean, they got 50% of their full of last year's bookings booked again. Uh, they got a partnership with a large home builder, which could be a risk or a strength. I mean, if you're not going to like this one, like you must just not like pool construction, right? Or well, am I totally right. missing? Well, like, any deal looks bad at the wrong price. That's my, that's my counter argument there. Like, like I would have to say, okay, yeah, qualitatively, like sign me up. Quantitatively, like it, it, the price matters, right? Um, in terms of, of these aren't, you know, these the, these are real businesses that need to generate cash flow as a return on on the money we put into it. So that's the only asterisk I put next to what you say, which is qualitatively, like <laughs> high quality business from what we're seeing so far. Quantitatively, like being the cheap person that I am, we have to be careful here. <laughs> well, all right. So what I'm going to say is maybe you're being a little too cheap, right? So what? this is. This is full. Quit, quit yeah, looking for right. cigar so butts. Yeah. Quit looking all for right. cigar so, butts. <laughs> well, yes, but I mean, like, what's that saying, right? I, I'd I'd rather pay a fair price for a good business than a, uh, a good price for a fair business, right? Like, if this is a good business, like, well, let's assume you can check the box on the Glazier thing isn't a risk and, uh, you know, you think this is generally a good pool construction business and you're trying to buy a pool construction business and it's in a good market. You know, is five times like, can you make it work? Debt is super cheap right now. This is at pretty asset light, as we've talked about. They just got nine pickup trucks. So there's no, probably not much CapEx below EBITDA. Uh, it's you got relatively good forward revenue visibility, right? In a growing market. So you could probably put a little bit of debt on this thing. So, I mean, I think you could pencil this to 40% plus IRR, even paying five times. So I, I, I agree with that logic, Bill. The, the issues that I'm raising, I think, are, are I'm not saying like, hey, here's all the issues and you don't do the deal. It's, hey, here's all the headwinds that worry me. Here's all the risks. And these are the things I want to talk to the seller about. Because if you're going to pay up, right, and let's just assume that this is maybe slightly overvalued on a multiple of free cash flow relative to peers, then there need to be reasons why this business is better than average and commands a better than average multiple. Part of, part of my issue and, and what I would want to talk to the sellers about is their customer acquisition funnel has probably largely been tied to a captive relationship that may or may not continue. If it's 15% of sales, then you underwrite it like anything else. But if it's 65% of sales, then you're, you're talking about a lot of risk. The bigger risk mm -hmm. in my mind, though, is going forward – you're talking about an $80,000 average order value. You can afford to throw a lot of money at customer acquisition cost in the pool space. And people do throw a lot of money at customer acquisition cost in this industry. And so if they have zero practice, zero experience, they don't have a team built for it, then you, what I see is for this business to continue to grow, not even at the rate it's been growing, but just nominally, they are going to have to basically scrap their customer acquisition funnel up until this point and build something new. Now, it doesn't mean that the the relationship with home builders has to go away. It's just that, hey, I can't underwrite it as this business continuing to grow at the same rate with the same margin profile because it's fundamentally going to change as it goes from two million in earnings to you know three or four million dollars in earnings. And those types of conversations with sellers, I think, earn you a lot of credibility because it shows them that you're thinking about the same issues that they probably see around the bin. So, you, I mean, there's ways to structure around that. I would, Like, let's say Glacier comes in at 60% of all new business. Like, clearly, that's a huge risk. I mean, that I immediately reach for my earnout button at that point, right? The Glacier's got to stick around uh, in order for them to get full value. Um, the flip side of what you say, though, Mills, is if they're if they're basically leaning on Glazier as a crutch, right? You could look at that as a moat. You know, I can get off, go off the street and spin up some Google ads and customer acquisition. Like that's not super proprietary. You know, I can bolt that on. What I can't bolt on is a strategic relationship with Glazier Homes. Yeah. Right. So yep. you could say, hey, there's a there's a growth opportunity here. If I can get my my comfort around the fact that Glazier is not going anywhere or protect against them going somewhere with an earnout, mm -hmm. then I have an opportunity to build around that hard candy center, you know, a, a more commodified demand gen platform yeah. and really scale this thing. Yeah. What I, I would probably want something stronger than an earnout. Like if it's if this is truly like a family held asset and they're divesting part of their portfolio this specific operating business, I would want like a put. So if if the business goes away with Glacier, I want to be able to put the business back to you at a fixed price. 
for the mm-hmm. next call it five to 10 years, right? Because the earnout might be nominal to them. And so it, like, okay, let's say the earnout goes away and there's no contingent payments that get paid to them, but your revenue goes from 23 to $11 million, you know, then all of a sudden you're still in a really, really bad spot. And I would want the ability to have more teeth than just, hey, I'm not going to pay you any of my contingent payments. Is there an opportunity here to go and broaden that builder relationship beyond just their family business, beyond the the Glacier Homes folks? Is that part of the strategy for something like this? I think you could, but it's, I mean, one, it's super competitive because everybody you know, everybody goes after those types of accounts. Like in a recent episode, we were talking about, you know, selling, um, you know, lotions and potions to big box stores. It looks really good on the surface, but I think when you get into it, you find this is super competitive and there's a cost to these large chunks of revenue. But, but yes, you certainly could try. Um, the other thing I'd be curious about and Jake, you know, you've probably figured this out, but permits are public information. So You know, if if you get your garage door changed or you paint your house or, you know, you put exterior lighting on your house, that's not permitted work. But digging into the ground and putting a swimming pool in the ground is permitted and it's regulated. So you can search, you know, with, you know, with whatever municipality you're looking at and you can figure out how many permits were there for pools last year. If, you know, if, if this county says that there were, you know, a thousand, then you know, okay, I have 300 out of a thousand. Maybe there's some room to grow and I can take market share. If it says that there's 250 permits last year, then you need to go press like crazy and figure out, you know, why are you telling me that you built more pools than the entire county did? So one thing I I do potentially like about this, you know, this this guy Glazier, um, who appears to be running a custom home builder called Glazier Homes, started this business, recruited his old friend and graduate, Mitch Hudspin, who still wants to stay with the business. Like I could see a scenario in which, man, I'm happy to, I understand why this business is being sold, right? Jared has been running and is probably still the CEO of his home construction company, making money over hand over fist in Austin for the past decade easily. Um, And this is a great business, but not as good as his core one. So you know, I could see that that kind of story looking here, and I'd want to dig into that to to go back to this idea of like, why are they selling? Like, what's what's the catch? <laughs> and is it is well, it I price? Mean, is it focus? Is it whatever? They've gone from zero to twenty three million dollars in sales. You know, since two thousand ten, like that's a that's a pretty good run. You know, yeah. So I think they're probably going, hey, look, I put in the work, and I'd like to get paid for it. Um, there's just a lot of questions here. And I think somebody mentioned, you know, the nature of the EBITDA adjustments is going to be really important. Does this company share admin? Do they share overhead? Or there's some kind of, you know, inner family related cost? Um, is, is it a standalone business or is it basically a carve out? And hopefully they've done their homework. They're at $2 million in EBITDA. So, you know, hopefully they've kind of done some prep work to actually be a separate entity you know, they're not, not a lot of shared services. Like, oh, we don't, we don't have anybody who answers the phone here. We don't have our own controller or CFO. All that comes from the home builder. Like th- those kind of things could get kind of messy. And I've, I've definitely seen that even surprisingly up market. So one, one thing they talk about here is provide, they're looking for a partner to come in and provide the capital and vision for high growth. Um, these businesses are typically pretty CapEx efficient, right? You're just buying some trucks here and there and you know, we're we're not sure if they're they're running their own crews or not. But other than that, everything I know about this business, you're not making big capital expen- expenditures. What what do you think they're talking about with that? Provide the capital and vision for high growth. Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that they're you know touting the fact that they bought nine pickup trucks tells you that they don't have they don't have significant capex in the form of like rolling stock. They're they're not self performing. I, I would be amazed if they were self performing. Um, so I mean the. The only thing I can think in terms of growth is they're thinking we need to build out a sales and marketing team. We need to open another office. We need to hire salespeople like and they just don't want to do that out of operating cash flow. They want somebody to come in, um, you know, probably, you know, I mean, this is the weird thing about this. And there's this isn't really a broker. It's just a guy. And I I tried Googling him and, and it's not really clear what he does or what his role might be. But let's say you pay the requested $8 million, $8.4 million for 80% of the business, and you put some money in the seller's pockets. They own 20%, you own 80. That is not money to fund growth. 
that is money to facilitate an exit. There's a million dollars cash on the balance sheet and it's still there. Now, chances are they're probably going to want you to pony up some more cash to help fund this growth if they're looking for a growth partner. So it, it, I think they've kind of got their wires crossed a little bit and you'd really want to figure out what is the plan for how growth, you know, CapEx is going to be allocated and what's the return on that and what's, what's the risk. All right. Cool. Well, let's wrap this one up. I know we've got another one. Um, have we got a sponsor read in the middle here or are we going straight through? Straight through. Straight on through. All right. Um, who's reading the next one? I got this one. So this is another pool construction um, business, and it is, I would say, almost the opposite. I, this, this Reading this one makes me like the other one. So this is from uh, Everingham and Kerr. It uh, is a pool construction company located in the mid-Atlantic region. Uh, highlights are $18 million in revenue with $6.2 million in normalized EBITDA. They're a nationally recognized premier custom in-ground pool builder They're ranked in the top 50 pool builders in the country for 15 plus years and running. By the way, whenever you see that, what's really nice is you can Google that for previous years and you can kind of verify some of their revenue. Um, That's probably Pool and Spa News, which is the industry publication for this industry. Installation of four different types of in-ground pools, gunite, concrete slash vinyl, steel slash vinyl, and fiberglass. They do complete backyard design build. So maybe they're also doing some hardscaping or landscaping. They do complete service, warranty, and renovations. It's all performed in-house, they say. They have a full service retail store, strong management team in place, process and system-centric organization that is organized by department. That's all we got on this one. Uh, And and Jake, you may have a little bit of context, but um, that's the snippet that we got from the teaser. Sure. And I do have a little bit more. Uh, Mid-Atlantic seemed a little bit broad to me, so I I tried to do a little detective work, and it looks like uh, they're located just outside of uh, the Philadelphia area. I I guess I'm with you, Mills. I mean, just location on on its in itself, I would prefer Austin. Feel like it has a lot more going for it. Season wise, population wise, just demographics. But uh, when I heard Mid Atlantic, I was actually thinking, hey, okay, it might be okay if it's somewhere in North Carolina, but that's a little bit too far <laughs> south. So Philadelphia, you know, not, it's not a it's not a hard no, but it's I'm not as excited at the moment as it would be about North Carolina or Austin. Well, so let's double click on that. Like Mills, how does being in the Sun Belt differ for pool construction versus say being kind of north of the Mason Dixon line, right? So there's this this New York, Pennsylvania, Maine, like that seems like a not a fun place to be in the pool construction business compared to Phoenix, San Antonio, Austin, Florida. Like h- yes. how do those two markets differ? There's two kind of strikes, I would say, against kind of a a northeast uh, pool business. And this is one of, one of them is specific to anything in construction, but, but the first is that there's just not as much demand, right? I mean, you may, and they mentioned having a retail store. So that that's kind of another thing we need to double click on, but you know, most of these people in, in that part of the, the country might want like hot tubs, right. Or spas. You're not going to use a pool, but maybe a few months out of the year. And if you live in Scottsdale year round, you're like, I would love to be in a pool right now. There's no other option, right? You're not you, like you could do it year round. So the just the seasonality and the weather plays a big role in how much demand there is and how many people are actually spending money on pools. For anything construction related in the Northeast, you have to account for the fact that you do not have 12 calendar months to perform work. So like in the roofing trade in the Northeast, it's just too cold to put roofs down in a lot of cases, or there's snow on the roof and you have to remove the snow to re-roof. In this case, like you're not going to be building pools when, you know, it's sleeting and snowing outside and you have, you know, 16 inches of snow on the ground. So uh, there, there's a lot, there's a whole lot here. Those are small potatoes in my mind compared to the fact that they're saying they have $6.2 million in normalized EBITDA. That is a major, major red flag to me because it's it's in a kind of a non, you know, non high performing market geographically. 
and they're saying they have above average industry margins. I'm guessing that the normalization of that EBITDA is just crazy. Like it would make your head explode. I I don't know. Jake, did you did you get any detail on that? What's what's the ratio of book EBITDA to uh, adjustments? No, I don't I don't have uh, any additional color on that. That is something uh, I'm glad you pointed that out though. I'll, I'll definitely follow up with that. If there's like 2 million or like less than 2 million in EBITDA and there's like 4 million dollars in adjustments, I would not be surprised. Hmm. Yeah, and so the previous one said Mills said adjusted EBITDA, and this one says normalized EBITDA. Like, first so of all, probably, I think those are both made up words. But what? What <laughs> is there any difference between those two things? Yeah. So probably what happened is they're looking at you know maybe they had a really good first quarter, right? So if in the first quarter they did a million and a half dollars in earnings, that could be because of the timing of when jobs came in, when jobs got booked, how they collected, depending on their accounting. You know, then they then they're like, hey, look, I mean, if you just annualize or normalize the first quarter of the year, we're on track to do six point two million. Well, it could be that the fall and the winter is terrible and abysmal for them. So it's just who knows? It's just fun with numbers, I think. Uh, they both when I see those, I both like, oh, fake EBITDA. <laughs> These are fake <laughs> EBITDAs. Uh, yeah. So how does how, how does the COVID boom? I mean, I guess we talked about this before, but maybe rehash it for me a little bit. Like how to how to think about underwriting these businesses when COVID comes in? Do we think it's all pulled forward demand, or do we think do we think par- it's partially pulled forward demand, or do we think that you know these guys know something we don't know, and it's going to be it's going to be cratering soon? I mean, Jake, what are you seeing? You you've been digging into some of these. What what what's your sentiment? It seems like a lot of this is pulled forward. I talked, I've talked to some industry experts. Every without fail, every single one of them mentions outdoor living. You know, accentuating the backyard. We're we're at home more. We're trying to expand our living space. It, it, I mean, all of them mention it, and mm-hmm. so I would say there's a COVID boom, and. Uh, I think everybody I've talked to would agree with that. I think even they even mentioned, um, you know, they're, they're helping with like outdoor kitchens, outdoor fireplaces, outdoor living spaces, and trying to like ramp up their business that way and um, diversify a little bit that way. Um, So it's been a common theme. Yeah. Yeah. So I will give you the, I will give you the case for maybe the swing back to normalcy or to the mean, the mean trend line won't be as bad as we think is at least in my house. Like we have been very careful about seeing, oh, like getting your roof done, like is not expensive, is super expensive right now. We're going to push that back. Cars, super expensive. Well, we don't need a new one. We can live with what we got unless it's a must. And we've seen a big COVID boom on something. We've been delaying stuff until like, okay, when things come back to normal, I'll get a new car, that type stuff. So I do think there will be some demand that is pent up in that way. But yeah, there's also the people that were just stuck in their house, bored to death and needed a pool and were paying whatever it took to get one at the time. Um, so well, the, it, the reason that guys out. like Brent and Xavier like these businesses is that fundamentally people aren't going to stop swimming, right? People aren't going to stop, you know, putting pools in their backyards. Like there's no, you know, Amazon's not going to beat this business type thing. I mean, it's just Hmm. fundamentally human nature. Like people like getting in water to cool themselves off and to have fun and to have recreation. So there will always be persistent demand. It's just a matter of, are you entering a market where the business has some, some kind of sustainable competitive advantage to capture that demand? Are you entering, you know, a market that has net population growth or net population decline? Like this area could be net population decline, right? And and you're you're kind of fighting, you know, a losing battle. The retail service, the full full service retail is also kind of an element of this to me. Retail is we know, we we've looked at them and it it doesn't take a lot of math to figure out that retail is hard. You have to have some kind of outlet to sell people. All all the people that you install their pools, they're going to ask you, do you want to maintain my pool? Do you want to clean it? Do you want to, you know, do all the chemicals and things like that? And that's a fundamental decision about whether or not you want to provide that service. And there's different schools of thought there. But also you get to sell chemicals, which is pretty good margin. You're functioning almost like, you know, a middleman and a distributor. The, The nice thing about it is that most people don't want to, you know, several times a summer come get, you know, 
30, 40, 50 gallon bags and five gallon pails of stuff and then figure out the ratio and did they add too much? And it's like stuff that, you know, you don't want to like spill in the back of your car. So there, there is an element there, but the other side of that argument is if you're really freaking good at selling and building pools, then this is just a distraction. Like get out of the retail business, just focus on high margin construction and let somebody else mess with that stuff. So you kind of have to figure out like this feels a little bit like we're trying to be all things to all people. Hey, we'll do your backyard. We'll plant trees and shrubs. Do you need lighting? Do you need a kitchen? Do you need a pool? You know, we'll sell you the stuff. It's just I, I think you got to really drill down into what you want. And and Bill talks a lot on the podcast, Jake, about buyer business fit. You know, do you want to be running a retail store? Do you want to be running, you know, a home services business showing up in people's yard on a route, you know, cleaning their pool, adding chemicals? It just depends on what you're looking for. Yeah, you know, when I do a, a diligence on a business like this, it's easy. So, Mills, I think you're probably right. Um, I always find it's worth asking the question instead of coming in and going, uh, you know, we're just going to close that retail store. That sounds terrible. Yeah. It's worth it to ask the seller, why do you have a retail store? And what they'll probably say is, oh, you know, my son needed a job. And, you know, we figured we had a bunch of chemicals and we got good prices on them. So we gave it a shot. And, you know, it makes $200,000 a year. So it kind of doesn't make sense to close it blah, blah, blah. Or they might say something that you didn't see coming. Like if you have a retail store, you can then buy chemicals from these vendors who won't sell to anybody that doesn't have a retail store. So it could be strategic, um, but it's, it's probably not, but it's or, usually worth asking why. Or, or I wouldn't be surprised if they told you, this is how we get most of our customers when they're like, my pool is leaking. Well, Hey, we just, we just happened to build them. Would you like to buy an $80,000 pool? Uh, in Philadelphia, like I'm your guy, you know? So it wouldn't surprise me if that's what, what they say too. This is also one of the things I just, I hate about this corner of America is I kind of feel like a foreign citizen whenever I try to do this type of business in New York, Boston, you know, Philly type area, because like, this is like, it's like a subculture on its own. It's like when I go down, like, if you've ever done business, like when you get close to the Mexico border, like, like, it's not like the same like business we're doing in middle America. <laughs> like, it scares me when I'm like, I just imagine somebody showing up with two goons and being like, okay, well, that's 6.2 normalized million EBITDA. You got to subtract 2 million because it's mine. This is my pool territory, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> I've watched enough of The Sopranos to just be scared to death of doing business in this area. So um, maybe I just totally advertise myself as somebody that could be easily shaken down. <laughs> but anyway, don't, <laughs> don't worry about any of that. But yeah, that's the other thing that's scary about this. It's it's just, it's pretty far away from, you know, this flyover Sunbelt stuff that I'm accustomed to. <laughs> All right. Cool. Anything else you have questions about on this one, Jake? Otherwise, I think, uh, I think this has been illuminating. No, no. I think this has been incredibly helpful. I appreciate it, guys. All right. Good cool. luck, Mills. Well, I think we are... Oh, did you have something else to say, Mills? I was just saying good luck. <laughs> God, no, that, that's the worst. That's the most discouraging thing I've ever seen in my whole life. May, what did that may mean? God, may God be with you, Jake. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, commercial for myself, like, like I put out these advertisements for associates to come work with me on projects and stuff. This is the kind of stuff you get to work on. Like, I I created the job that I would most like to have it when I was in my 20s or 30s or earlier in my career. And it seems like Jake's having a hell of a good time. So thanks for being here, Jake. Absolutely. All right, guys, we'll catch you next week.